Um, I, I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology in Liverpool, and since July of this year, I've had a, a national role in England in overseeing a number of uh, training initiatives that are occurring in what is a very rapidly changing landscape uh, in research funding in the UK. And I'm going to, the emphasis on, of my talk will be about training clinical academics, doctors who wish to combine a career in clinical medicine with, with research. But um, some of the training initiatives I'm talking, I will talk about do include um, non-doctors as well. Just briefly about the, the system in, in the UK, um, like Spain, we have a, a national health service. National health service is funded by the, the taxpayer. Um, there is free um, treatment for, for all, and there is a relatively small um, private sector. In 1991, there was recognition that there should be research and development within the national health service and um, a programme for research and development was instituted. But most of the, the money, and there was quite considerable sums of money um, put into the, this programme, but the, the, the money went into hospitals to um, permit a, an infrastructure to allow research to take place. That, that was the theory. The reality was that the, the money went into the hospital budgets and there was a lack of transparency about what actually happened to the money. And much of, of this money, in fact, went into a clinical service provision rather than for research. And two years ago, in, in 2006, um, NHS Research and Development was renamed uh, National Institute for Health Research. Uh, and all of that money was, was pulled back centrally uh, and all of it is now very explicitly used to directly support uh, research, mainly patient-based applied uh, research. So there's been a very fundamental change in the, in the funding arrangements in the recent past. Um, NIHR does um, much more than look after training, which will be the, the focus of my talk. Um, it, it does support um, a, a number of individuals, uh, people um, who are either trainees or, or more senior investigators. Um, it also funds um, a lot of uh, applied research now, either through projects or through program grant schemes. Um, it has done a great deal to try and ease the process of, of doing research and trying to uh, dismantle some of the bureaucratic difficulties to applied research and has created a, a, a new infrastructure which includes um, centres uh, which have, uh, where there is strong expertise in particular areas of medical research and throughout the country has created research networks to facilitate the um, delivery of clinical trials whether investigator-led clinical trials or, or industry-led uh, clinical trials. The um, funding is, is really quite considerable, and the um, two um, national bodies that oversee, that fund research, are the Medical Research Council, which has been in existence for a long time, and now the National Institute for Health Research. And as the chairman said, there, there, there certainly has been a perception in the past that clinical research, applied research, did not receive the same degree of funding that, um, that basic research received. Uh, and now the, the amount of money is, is very similar that both bodies receive. And together, this is more than, than one billion pounds um, per annum. And it's now made quite clear that the Medical Research Council oversees basic laboratory-based research um, and the National Institute for Health Research uh, funds uh, clinical trials, um, systematic reviews, research synthesis like occurs at the, the Cochrane Centre here in, in Barcelona, 
um, health services research, qualitative research, and, and so on. And it's important to mention some other um, charities that um, provide, in some cases, very considerable amounts of research funding, including the Wellcome Trust, which is a very big player, Cancer Research UK as well. And Wellcome Trust Cancer Research UK fund both basic and, and patient-based research. It's, it's important, I think, when there is a lot of pressure on health systems um, and a lot of pressure for hospitals to deliver clinical care, it's important to remind management and administrators that the ultimate purpose of clinical research is to improve uh, patient care. And NIHR produced a, um, a book recently emphasizing some of the, the important um, original um, research that led to very tangible benefits that occurred in the NHS um, over the last 60 years. The NHS started in 1948 and it's 60 years old now, um, discovering the link between smoking and lung cancer, uh, the first total hip replacement, uh, took place in England by Charnley, the Glasgow Coma Scale, um, and the very first IVF baby, uh, the latter produced by um, Steptoe and Edwards uh, within the NHS, um, genetically engineered hepatitis B vaccine, prenatal steroids um, as uh, a, a very important um, treatment that evolved from research synthesis, putting together the results of, of many small trials and finding a very important treatment. And more recently, um, bioengineering heart valves from, from stem cells. Within the, the UK, um, the specialists are, are called consultants and just over 6% of consultants in, in hospitals um, are clinical academics. And these are the people who, who do most of, of the research. Some NHS consultants uh, who are not academics are also research active, but the bulk of research is performed, clinical research is performed by, by these people. And the clinical academics um, are employed by the university rather than by the hospital. And I'm a clinical academic, and, and um, before I took on this role, my job profile would be fairly typical. Um, I would spend about 50% of my time in patient care, and about 50% of my time on academic work, which would be mainly research, but also some, some teaching as well. And um, as employees of the university, um, we are assessed um, as is everybody working for universities in all subjects by a process called the research assessment exercise, which occurs every five years or so. And that is a, a peer review process that looks at uh, publications, looks at grant income, looks at number of uh, postgraduate students, and a panel makes an evaluation of the, the quality of an individual's uh, work and classifies that as, as internationally excellent, nationally excellent, or, or not. Um, and the results of the research assessment exercise have a major impact on the funding to universities. So it, it is a, a very serious, important process. But it, it has had some um, adverse consequences, and adverse consequences for clinical academic training. Um, and the reason for that is that um, trainee clinical academics in our system, lecturers, are, are trainees, are, are not independent researchers. And they, they have traditionally done very badly, understandably, in the research assessment exercise. And in consequence, uh, many universities, many medical schools got rid of these jobs because it was um, hindering the assessment and therefore their, their income from the, the government. And uh, as a result, there has been a, a loss of clinical academic posts um, in the UK. The Medical Schools Council uh, is, consists of the deans of the medical schools uh, and they produce a report each year looking at the number of academic posts 
And in this and the next slide, they've compared all academic posts, so that's training or specialist posts, in 2007 compared to 2000. And um, some specialties have maintained their number of positions, primary care and internal medicine, but some have done quite badly over the last um, seven years. Um, anesthetics have only 67% of the clinical academic posts compared to 2000, and pathology at less than 50%. So for most specialties, there has been a drop in the number of clinical academic posts, and in some subjects, a very serious drop in the number of, of posts. If we look at the, the training positions, the lecturer posts, again, 2000 compared to 2007, there is only half of the number of clinical academic, uh, clinical lecturer posts in all subjects in the UK. And in terms of, of training posts in some specialties, the very serious problem, so these are lecturer posts, uh, in pediatrics, pathology, psychiatry, public health, uh, all less than 25% of the number of posts, of training posts that existed in, in 2000. So this has caused very serious concern about the, the long-term future of clinical academic medicine. Other issues that cropped up, um, clinical academics are an aging population. Uh, those aged more than 46 have increased from 52% to 59%. Um, and women are underrepresented, especially in, in, in senior uh, positions. Only 12% of clinical professors in the UK are, are women. So um, a report um, was produced, um, which is called the Walport Report, after the, the, the chairman, who is Mark Walport, director of the, the Wellcome Trust. And um, it published a report in, in 2005 that made um, certain recommendations. It identified reasons why um, people were less keen on clinical academic medicine and dentistry, um, an absence of a, a very clear career structure, um, a lack of flexibility in balancing clinical and academic training, uh, lack of flexibility in moving around from centre to centre, and the worry about there being a shortage of appropriate posts at the end of training in which individual doctors could combine their clinical interests um, and their interests in, in research. And a number of initiatives um, happened as a, as a result of that. And NIHR is responsible for um, many of these, these training posts. So whilst NIHR, in terms of research funding, funds applied research, in terms of clinical training, it applies, it supports um, trainees who are doing either applied research or also basic uh, research. And the, the new posts that have been created have been these NIHR academic clinical fellowships and NIHR um, clinical lecturers. There are existing um, posts which are um, personal uh, research training fellowships which doctors, nurses, um, other types of professional can, can apply for. Um, there is support for those training in health economics, which is a very important um, subject these days. There is uh, an NIHR clinical scientist post, for, which is for quite a senior person, just at the coming towards the end of training, who is just um, changing into a, an independent um, researcher, research leader. And there is also a scheme for people working in, in primary care uh, as well. But I'm just going to concentrate on, on these two here, the academic clinical fellowship and the clinical lecturer posts. And how, how they fit into the, the clinical training system is, is shown here. So the, the, this is the, um, the, the, these are the undergraduates, the, the medical students. Um, our, our basic um, medical degree is, is the MB. Um, some students do do research. They take a year to do out to do a intercalated, what's called an intercalated BSc. 
Um, a few, not very many, but a few take a three-year gap to, to achieve a PhD, but that's quite unusual. And we have an increasing number of graduate entries, students who have already done a, another degree. Once they finish in medical school, um, then all doctors spend um, two years learning basic generic clinical skills. Um, that's called academic foundation years. Then they will move into um, specialist training, which will take um, between five and seven years usually. Uh, and and that's, for the, that's for the doctors, all doctors who, who are wanting to become specialists. So the, the idea about the, these new posts is the academic clinical fellows um, will be appointed at an early stage of the clinical training. And within that post, they will spend 25% of their time in research training and 75% of the time in clinical training. The idea is that that will give them the experience and the basis to apply for an externally funded training fellowship which they will do for three years, get their PhD, come back into the training system again, hopefully get a clinical lecturer post where the balance is 50-50, 50% 50, 50, 50 uh, research training, 50% clinical training, and then move on to become the, the clinical academic specialists of the, of the future. Quite a large amount of money is, is going into this. The academic, integrated academic training posts, the academic clinical fellows and clinical lecturers uh, is about uh, 38 million euros this year and is going up. The other fellowships about uh, 18 million euros. And because these um, academic clinical fellow posts are, are new, um, we've gone to some effort to try and understand what the experience of the individuals is like, and we've got some empirical data about what's working well and what's not working well. Um, the, uh, there have been a, a number of um, difficulties. Um, the, um, by and large, the, the feedback we've had from this um, stock take funded by the Wellcome Trust is that things are working well. That there were difficulties with uh, appointments. I won't, go into, I won't bore you with the details of that. Um, the, these posts um, involve three different organisations. Um, the postgraduate deaneries supervise clinical uh, training within a region. There are the medical schools, and then there are the hospitals, which we call the hospital trusts. And sometimes there has been um, difficulty at that organizational interface. An important issue has been protection of research time. That's been particularly a problem with um, trainees who are trying to do research a day a week. If they do the research time in a block of three months, six months, nine months, then the research time is much better protected and they're not sent off to, to, to do clinics and so on. Um, there is some inconsistent quality of, of supervision. Um, mainly it was um, overall good, but there, in some individual cases, the, the quality of supervision was, was not what we would expect. Of the academic clinical fellows, uh, over half do plan a career in academic medicine. About two-thirds had a, a degree already, and 81% uh, did plan to apply for a research training fellowship. Uh, rather alarmingly, given that the, the reason for these posts is that so that they can apply can credibly for externally funded research training fellowship that only 3% had had training in writing funding applications. So given the information that we now have, uh, there, these posts have existed for two years. We, we've made quite a significant change to the, the scheme from, um, from now, in fact. Um, and the one difficulty was that many of these posts were concentrated in a relatively small number of uh, medical schools, you know, some of which are, are, are absolutely internationally excellent. But it meant that there were medical schools, and especially some of the newer medical schools, where there were no posts, and that limited their ability to develop uh, research training capacity. 
So the, there's a new scheme where these, so all medical schools will have some of these posts, albeit in some cases quite small numbers. We've encouraged greater flexibility in the past. These posts have been tied to a specific specialty and sometimes there haven't been appropriate people of the appropriate caliber applying. We've encouraged greater flexibility by medical schools to a point. Um, ARCP is a um, process of appraisal for uh, clinical trainees. Um, for academic trainees, we feel strongly that that appraisal process should involve both clinical trainers and academic trainers simultaneously, and that isn't happening uh, as widely as it should at the moment. And we've emphasised the need to teach, um, formally teach, um, about uh, research skills and research governance as well. Um, the academic clinical fellows are employed by hospitals, but they need to have university, honorary university contracts to access all that the universities have. And we're going to start visits to centres to identify what's working well and, and what's not working so well. But th these are uh, new posts and we, we're very carefully monitoring outcome because uh, we, we don't know yet just how successful this scheme is, is going to be. Th there is a specific scheme for dentistry where there, there are particular problems. Um, dental graduates don't usually have further training. They can go off and, and earn a lot of money and drive a BMW so that there's particular difficulties with developing a cadre of, of um, clinical academics and dentistry. And I've concentrated very much on, on the doctors, but the, there are different um, schemes being developed at the moment for um, nurses, midwives, and other allied health professions, physiotherapists, uh, and so on. Um, there's a new scheme for healthcare scientists. So th these are for scientists working in NHS laboratories in, in hematology or biochemistry um, who wish to devote some of their, their time to research. There is now a scheme whereby they can get funding for that. Um, research methodology, especially in applied research, is, is changing very rapidly and, and there are schemes to fund that and SDO is service development and organization. So ways of getting research findings in, into practice and quite a bit of funding is going into to, to that as well. So I've, I've tried to give um, a, an overview of, of um, what's um, happening at the moment. Um, so things have happened really very quickly, um, but there, there has been this um, separation of responsibilities, um, so it is now very clear who funds basic research um, and very clear who funds uh, applied research and uh, both MRC and NIH are getting about half a, a billion um, pounds per year to, to support their work. Mm. Um, we've recognised that there have been some worrying developments um, in encouraging the development of the, the clinical academics, the clinical researchers of the future. And we've instituted a, a number of initiatives which we hope will bear fruit in the future. Thanks very much for your attention. Okay.